Is the mind just puffs of smoke given off by the machine that is the brain? Let's consider. Hello, philosophers. I'm Chico. Welcome to The Philosopher's Show, where we consider the greatest questions of human history. We've gotten to the point in our philosophy of mind playlist where we're going to consider property dualism. This is the view that holds, first of all, some properties exist that are not physical. And by not physical, I mean can't be described using physics and can't be reduced away like in reductionism. However, in property dualism, neither is it the case that people are full-blown non-physical entities either. We are not souls, in other words. We don't have anything like that. Instead, what is the case is that we are material beings and our material selves have non-physical properties. So our brains, in other words, have these non-physical properties like thoughts or experiences, things like that. Now, what would that look like? Well, we're gonna look at a few different possibilities, the first of which today we'll talk about is epiphenomenalism. So let's say that you were convinced by one of our previous arguments that mental properties are real, right? Like maybe it was the qualia argument and you believe that qualia, qualitative experience is real, that's a real thing and it's a non-physical thing. So, um, where does that come from? What, what is the source of these qualia? Where, where do they come from? Well, one possibility that is explored by epiphenomenalists is that they come from our brain, that our brain produces them. Um, and why I think that? Well, when I was in Philadelphia, I had surgery on my foot and they gave me anesthesia. And I remember like, first of all, they tell you to count it down from 10. And I was all worried, like, what if it doesn't work? You know, like, what if... I, uh, I get down to one and then I'm still awake and then like they start they start working on me. I don't think I made it to nine guys. I mean, I was like, <laughs> I'm a lightweight. I was just out. Um, so I, I go into surgery and really bizarre in the middle of the surgery, I remember like just uh, coming to and it wasn't like waking up from a dream. It wasn't like I was asleep instead. I was awake already and I was singing and I just started to realize, whoa, what am I doing? I'm, I'm singing. Uh, and that's when the doctor realized that, oh, this guy's coming out of it. And they told the anesthesiologist, hey, go put him under again. Um, lo and behold, I was out. And then again, when I, when I woke up from the surgery, it was really bizarre. I remember it wasn't like I woke up it was like I was uh, just all of a sudden regained consciousness and I had already been chewing ice and talking to my wife and uh, had no like conscious experience of it. You know, it was really bizarre, man. If you think about that, that's just, uh, it's a little spooky, you know, like you could have been saying, I could have been saying anything. And I, I mean, we're still married, so I luckily I didn't say anything bad, but you know, it could have gone, could have gone south. So it's interesting. You put these chemicals in your brain, you know, and the consciousness goes away, take the chemicals out, the consciousness uh, reappears. Maybe the brain is what uh, produces the consciousness. So that's what epiphenomenalists believe. Now this leaves epiphenomenalists kind of in a bind here because they also hold to what is called the causal closure of physics. And that means that every cause is describable using physics. So one billiard ball causes another billiard ball to move. Why is that? Well, we can describe why it is using physics alone. Now, if there are these things, qualia, and these you know mental properties like thoughts and whatever, whatever the case, then they also would would uh, go into explaining like my actions. So let's say that I accidentally did say something crazy and my wife was all upset with me, then I would get this experience of, oh, angry wife. And then my thought would say, you should apologize. And then that would cause me to say, I am sorry, right? That would be a non-physical cause, uh, the thought. Of, uh, and the choice that I make. So that would go against one of their very cherished beliefs, uh, causal closure nature of, uh, of physics. So what's the solution here? 
Epiphenomenalists will say that, sure, these mental properties exist. However, they are causally inert. In other words, they don't actually cause anything to happen. Which may sound kind of weird for a second if you think about it, right? So, like, I have a thought. Isn't that what causes me to say, hey, I'm sorry, babe. Didn't mean to get crazy on you. Um, and they'll say, well, you have that thought. Yes. And it seemed like that's what caused you to say that. However, that's not what caused you to say that. Instead, it was the neurochemicals in your brain, you know, reacting in a particular way that 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 totally explains why you said what you said and the thoughts that you had that appeared to be causing you to say that were just like like uh, an extra byproduct from the brain a favorite metaphor they have is it's like the heat dissipating from a car engine so a car engine causes the car to go forward you know um and as a byproduct, heat is released. Now, the heat doesn't actually cause anything to happen in the car, right? The heat is just a, a byproduct of the engine working. Um, the, the real purpose of the engine is, you know, to cause the car to move forward. And yet you can't get rid of this extra heat. That would be like the mind. The mind is like this heat being given off by the brain that... Uh, that's not the purpose of the brain. The brain is is built so that you can navigate the real world, so you can avoid predators, so that you can, you know, find food to eat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but as a, as a natural byproduct, you have this, you know, this extra thing popping out. You could think about it as almost like a robot. Um, we are we would be like robots. Uh, you know, a robot doesn't actually experience anything a robot has photons hit its receptors you know which causes certain programs to work which will produce certain behaviors like its robot arm going up um well we would be the same thing except for as we're doing that our hardware has this extra stuff that's being produced um as an accident right? The, this consciousness that is being produced, uh, almost like puffs of smoke coming off of it. Now, epiphenomenalism is not a very popular view. Um, and that is probably because it is so counterintuitive. So that's the biggest objection to it. They claim that the way the world works is that you have all these experiences and yet they don't contribute in any way causally to your actions. And that seems totally against everything that, that you experience, right? I mean, it, to borrow a uh, an example from Searle, um, it's like you go to a restaurant and you look at the menu and what do you do? Sit back and see what you're going to order, right? Like, no, you, you're, it, it sure seems like you are causing yourself to, to make these decisions, right? Like you're, you're causing your your voice to go out and, and say, I will have the milkshake and hamburger, please. So sometimes philosophy does give us very counterintuitive results and that's just life. But this seems pretty contrary to our intuitions. And the only reason we would wanna have this view in the first place is because we wanna save the causal closure of physics. And um, first of all, there are other ways to do that without having these very counterintuitive results. But second of all, if our philosophy is going to result in something so wildly counterintuitive as epiphenomenalism, then probably we should just drop the causal closure nature of physics, right? We probably should just say, okay, I suppose there's some things that physics doesn't explain. Oh, well, rather than to say that, yeah, I have a mind, but it does nothing, right? It just sits back and watches it seems like it's doing work but it's just sit back and watches and uh enjoys itself there are a couple of other objections to emergentism one of them being that it doesn't really explain how the brain could produce this you know these phenomena these how they could produce qualia it just seems like totally like what some a pile of neurons just magically shoots out this stuff like how is that possible uh, but we'll talk about that objection more when we get to emergentism. And then uh, there are a bunch of arguments 
for substance dualism over property dualism that we'll, we'll see going forward as well. But yeah, the real big objection is the counterintuitive nature of of this view. For that reason, most philosophers will reject this view. In any case, that is all I have on epiphenomenalism. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments. And yeah, like I, I used to always say this and I need to get back into saying this, the best philosophy happens in dialogue. So definitely hit me up in the comments with whatever you, what do you think about this view? Do you think that the counterintuitive nature is, is enough to just make us dismiss it? Or should we take this view seriously? And that's all I got for today. Adios.